Set on Zoom. Yeah, we're streaming live on Facebook. Okay, awesome. Great. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to my talk today. I am very, very fortunate to have with us, with me, Michelle Palmer, who is the Executive Director of the Went Center for Loss and Healing here in Washington, D.C. As you know, I'm Dr. McBride and I'm pleased as punch to bring Michelle here today because she does incredible work. The WENT Center does incredible work for 45 years. It has been around in, as a nonprofit in DC, helping people navigate trauma and grief. Um, Michelle is a licensed clinical social worker and she has been in DC for 20 years. She's been at the WENT Center for seven and a half years. And let me just tell you what the WENT Center does. They do office-based therapy for individuals and groups in two locations in Northwest and in Southeast. They also do incredible school-based counseling, which of course they can't do right now in a pandemic, but counseling young people who are dealing with trauma and grief. So they dispatch their therapists to schools. And then they do some home-based therapy. And then they also do crisis response. So they dispatch their people all over the country in certain moments. So they are on the front lines. They are on the front lines of the mental health crisis always, and particularly right now. And as I've said before, you know, to me, this is not just a crisis of physical health. It's not just about flus and coughs. It's about mental health. This is a mental health crisis and pandemic, and it's only getting more intense. And so I am going to hand the baton to Michelle to tell us a little bit more about the WEN Center and the work that you do and what you were doing before the pandemic. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, um, the WEN Center serves specifically, as Dr. McBride said, uh, folks who are navigating the complexity of grief or loss and trauma and the intersection of both, which I think really uh, this intersection of grief and trauma is, is really what folks are struggling with now. Um, but that is not new and that is stuff that people have been struggling with in the DC metro area um, for as long as I can remember. I've been the executive director at the One Center for seven and a half years, but um, when I moved to DC, I uh, started volunteering. We have a grief camp called Camp Forget Me Not Camp Erin DC. Incredible. Um, it's a weekend long grief camp for kids ages seven to 17. And 20 years ago, I started volunteering as uh, to be a buddy at camp. Um, oh my gosh, so the minute you landed in DC, that was what yes. you did. Yes. That's incredible. Yes. I, I heard this woman talk who used to be a therapist at the One Center. She has since retired. And it just blew me away. And I thought I need to be part of that work and part of that organization. So, um, so I've been there, I've been involved with the center for 20 years, seven and a half of which I have had the honor of uh, leading the ship. Um, what we were doing before this is actually very much what we are still doing. Um, the One Center has um, 43, I think, full-time and part-time employees, the majority of which are therapists. Um, and we were providing individual, group, family therapy with folks who have experienced either a very significant loss in their life or a very significant traumatic event. The reality, unfortunately, is many, many, many of the clients that the One Center serves have had multiple traumatic events. And I'm talking about even, even some of our youngest clients um, have experienced multiple traumas. Um, and I'm actually not a therapist who thinks everyone needs therapy, which I know is shocking. Um, but I think to be able to navigate multiple traumas, most of the time, most people need some professional support because it can just be so incredibly difficult. I think the same thing is true with grief, depending on 
what the relationship you had with, with the person was, with your person was. And oftentimes we also see a cause of death. Um, if the cause of death was a trauma, um, oftentimes we'll also see folks who need a little bit of professional support to sort of help get them through this, navigate this incredibly painful and difficult experience. And can I ask you a question about that for a minute, Michelle? Because I, I think this is this this would be a good point, I hope, to make for my patients and for other people wondering if they need grief counseling. You know, I, as you know, I'm a big proponent of therapy. I too don't think everybody needs therapy, although my patients might not believe me when I say that because I recommend therapy to, to so many people. And as I say to people all the time, not because you're crazy, but because you're human. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when I'm trying to convince someone to do grief therapy or trauma therapy, people will say back to me almost reflexively, well, I mean, of course I feel this way. And what are they going to tell me? How are they possibly going to help me? It's, you know, I have my friends to cry on their shoulder. And while that is true, there is a natural process when we're dealing with grief. There is a time and a place to add professional help. So maybe you could help us think about what are the reasons people might seek help. I mean, I, I know, and I can tell when someone needs added help. I mean, I think I can. Um, and I've, I've pretty much I pretty much have people come back to me and say, oh, I'm so glad I did that because I didn't realize how complicated this was before I started talking about it. But what are some indicators to you that someone needs more than just their friends? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes, actually, it is um, grief and trauma, uh, significant grief and trauma, untreated or unnavigated or you know, just not tended to manifests itself physically very frequently. And so what we'll often see actually is that people have gone to their doctor saying, exactly saying, you know, I've got constant GI upset or headaches or sleep disruption. Um, and there's not a physical reason for it. And, you know, I'm always so grateful to the docs who actually follow up and say, let's, is there something else happening? Did something else happen in your life um, that might actually be showing itself through your body? Um, but, you know, for typically what, what I think is a good indicator is, are you three months, six months, nine months after the event, struggling to manage the day-to-day. -day. Um, the ex Functioning. And, and yeah, and, and I mean, I'm talking basics. I'm talking, is your sleep still disrupted? Is your eating still disrupted? Um, are you still finding that you can't get through a whole day without a significant cry? I'm a big crier. Um, even in the best of times, I probably don't get through a day without crying because I'll watch like it. You might cry commercial. on this. Inter on, you might cry at this interview. I might. You never know. You never know. You never know. Um, By the way, I'm the same. I'm the same exact way. So beware. Yeah. So I don't think crying in and of itself is an indicator at all. But if it's if you don't feel like you can manage it, and it's you know it's a big big cry every day and it's been going on for a long time, um, it's probably a pretty good indicator that you need a little bit more support than the loving of your friends and your family. I think that's um, right. And, and you know, it's, it is funny. We hear that a lot from people at the One Center that I didn't realize that I could actually feel better. You know, I, I think when you're in it, a lot of people, the way that we cope is we think, okay, well, we're just, this is just the new normal. And this is how I'm, this is, I guess, just how I am for the rest of my life. And I'm going to be sad for the rest of my life. Um, and depending on what happened, will there be a bit of melancholy for the rest of your life? Probably. It's what we carry around with us. It's, it's, it helps us remember that we loved deeply and we lost. And that's actually just the human condition. Um, but that very difficult, painful, I feel like either 
there's a, like a weight sitting on my chest or I can't swallow because the sadness is all the way up to my chin. That's the stuff where I go, you might want to try and talk to someone. The other thing I want to say is finding a therapist is like finding a good pair of jeans. Oh my gosh, I could not agree with you more. And sometimes <laughs> one therapist is perfect for this person and the other, per it's really about chemistry. It is, it really is. Um, and so for folks who are thinking about, you know, do I wanna try therapy? If you go and you, and you don't feel a connection, don't give up. Stick with that clinician, stick with that therapist for at least two sessions to see if maybe you drive, and if not, ask for a referral to another therapist. I, I love what you're saying because it exactly matches what I'm saying, and I trust you implicitly, Michelle. Absolutely. One of, one of the things that makes me so upset for people is when they say to me when I recommend therapy, oh, I did therapy once and it wasn't for me. And I say, oh, wait a minute. Well, when was that? And how many times did you go? And they say, well, I saw this person twice, and I just realized therapy is not for me. So in my opinion, I mean, there is a person out there for you. Like there is a pair of jeans out there for you, no matter what your body type, no matter what your, you know, yeah. flair, but there is someone out there who can help you. And it's not simply a shoulder to cry on. There's a process. There's also a natural process of grief. But as yeah. you said, Michelle, when someone is struggling with what I call complicated grief. It's time to get some, some added help. Complicated grief, meaning like what you said, when people are having physical symptoms, which I talk to people about often and, and particularly in the pandemic, chest discomfort, you know, almost and sometimes real pain in the chest, yeah. headaches, sleep disturbance, gastrointestinal distress, yeah. sort of body pain sometimes people experience. And the, you're right, the basic biological needs that we have are sleeping, eating and relating to other people and functioning at work if you you know just your daily daily functioning if those things are 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 disrupted and in a prolonged way and you're you're having a hard time getting the the the, the steering the ship away from the iceberg so to speak help is there and i would absolutely give it another try if it's not right the first time with the therapist so give it another try or try someone else yeah Exactly. And honestly, I, you know, I hope that, you know, if a therapist is worth his or her salt, um, that they also feel it and say, you know, I want to check in. Does this feel okay to you or not? Because we, what we don't want people to do is to like, feel like they have to power through. <laughs> Well, it's like in therapy a relationship. is hard anyway. It's like in a, that's right. It's like it's like in a relationship, like any relationship. You don't want to like put a square peg in a round hole. It's like, you know, it has to be chemistry, but sometimes it takes time. And there is an inevitable first session or two where you're sort of giving the data and you know, that's people who are impatient are like, wait a minute, I was just talking and giving data. They weren't even talking back to me. Well, that has that will come. Yeah. And that will happen. But I do think you know, what I see all the time, and I'm not a therapist, I'm a medical physician, but what I see all the time, and this is one of the things I love about my job and what gives me hope and gets me out of bed in the morning, is seeing people who do the work on trauma and who do the work on grief and sometimes the intersection of both, or do the work on their anxiety, their OCD, their depression, other mental health issues, and they are better physically and mentally. They feel yeah. more in control of their emotional health they feel more in control of their daily habits and their medical outcomes improved. And that's, that's actually the reason I'm in medicine is to, to help people understand that mental health is relevant. And so particularly with trauma, particularly with grief, it's, it's just important to raise your hand and get help when you need it. There's no shame. It's, 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 it's part of being human is to need help every now and then. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> grief is a universal human experience. Yes. If you are in a relationship, that relationship is going to end one way or another. Um, and you will likely grieve it. And sometimes we have what we need to navigate it, and sometimes we don't. That's right. So talk to me, if you could, about how the pandemic has, I mean, I know you're doing the same work, and maybe it's the same work on steroids, because there's so much trauma. I mean, this is a collective trauma. 
And of course, certain people are more vulnerable than others. Certain populations, like we know that the African American community is, you know, getting sick and 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 having worse outcomes at an incredibly high incre higher rate, um, disproportionately higher rate. Um, so how how has the pandemic changed the landscape of what you're doing, the intensity of it? I'm I'm very interested to hear about that. It, the what the pandemic has done is um, it has it has made accessing support much more difficult, and so people actually aren't able to rely on their natural networks because they just don't have access to them in the same way. We're not able to rely on the rituals that are, that are, that are very grounding. Um, there's a reason we have them. And one of the reasons is uh, to sort of formally recognize what somebody's going through. Um, and so what we're seeing is actually, um, it's a combination of things. I think, I think there are certainly some folks who have a lot of anxiety, who came into this pandemic with anxiety, who may have underlying physical health issues and this pandemic has, has made them terrified to leave their house. Um, because it has magnified the anxiety um, and it has made them feel unsafe. Um, and, you know, when we feel unsafe, one of the things that we do, one of the first things we do is we figure out how we can gain a little bit of control back because that's what that's about. And so we're seeing folks who are afraid to leave their house. Um, and so the connection to their therapist is really important, um, both because it keeps them connected to other people, but also because you ha you have to you have to work through it so that it doesn't hold you in inside literally and 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 metaphysic metaphorically and metaphysically um, <laughs> all of the things all of those uh, things yeah um, but we're also seeing because. Um, because of this isolation, people are still dying. You know, the homicide rate in DC has not decreased in spite of the fact that we are quarantined. Um, and so people are still grieving and they don't have the support that they need, the support that they would normally have. And so we're also seeing folks needing um, you know, short-term sort of two-session stabilization where, where we can just sort of, you know, especially in the wake of, of a sudden death, it is so upending in every single way um, that folks need a grounding and a stabilization. And so we're actually seeing this need for short-term appointments, um, again, where folks might have gone to wherever, to their parents' house, to friends' homes, to siblings' homes, they just don't have that access. So we're also, we're also seeing that, um, you know, we're doing some support for the healthcare workers who, you know, are exhausted at this point and, you know, they're sacrificing their well-being, they're sacrificing family time, you know, um, and so they're, we're also seeing they're needing additional mental health support um, to sort of not just prop them up, but help keep them propped up. Because I don't know that anyone, you know, this is a hard pace to sustain physically and emotionally. Right, um, it's a marathon, and, and the other part about is. the trauma, as you well know, is that that it's it's not ending. There's no end in sight. Um, not that there's an end in sight for you know someone else's trauma, but the coronavirus, what we're dealing with right now, is is uniquely traumatizing in that 
you know, it is, we don't know when it's going to end and we are, and the other part of it is, as you know, is the threat is invisible, right? right. Someone who looks perfectly fine could give the virus to you. So, you know, there are all these reasons, I mean, that I don't even need to go over as to why it's traumatizing. The lives lost, the routines lost, the rituals lost, the social life lost, you know, people losing their jobs, people not being in school. Um, I mean, unemployment, I mean, financial ruin, the economic, I mean, there, and then of course, the increased attention and rightly so on racial injustices, not that that's new either. I mean, that's an ongoing trauma for the black community that those wounds have, you know, those are ongoing. It's not like it's new, but I mean, there's so much to take in right now and so much to process. And so that is where I do find that, that that I'm, I'm recommending to my patients that they, and some of them are healthcare workers, and um, to, to ask for extra help and to make sure you're prioritizing, you know, getting some fresh air, getting exercise, making sure you're getting sleep, making sure you're, you know, socializing, you know, as much as you can and, and asking for help, as you said. Yeah, it's, it's, it's super, it's super important. You know, you know, human beings, we tend to, to heal relationally. And in a pandemic that actually is telling you not to be in relationship physically, um, the impact of that is pretty significant. Yeah. And then, you know, we also have, um, you know, we do have folks who are dying of, of this illness and, and the family members who are suffering knowing that their loved one died alone, didn't die surrounded in the way that we kind of all hope and envision for ourselves and those we love that we will be encased in love by those who spend the most time with us. And to not have that, it adds a complexity and a pain and a, an extra layer of suffering to folks who are already suffering. Yeah. and. As you said in the beginning, I mean, we are wired as human beings for survival, which is why a lot of people feel anxious in a pandemic when you feel out of control and you feel the threat. Our, our, you know, our brains are wired to survive. We're, we're, we're wired to run from the danger in the wild. And it's why, in the, particularly in the beginning of the pandemic, people had the heart racing, the chest pounding, the sweaty palms, and people still have that now. Um, but we're also wired for connection. Like we're not meant to be alone. I know some of my introverted patients and friends and actually some of my family members are like happy to be at home, but most people, even if you're introverted, need connection. And yeah. the Zoom is something, but there's nothing like personal connection. I'm finding that now that I'm seeing more of my patients in person for the parts of the physical exam that we can't do virtually, we're doing most of our physicals virtually, but the part that you can't do virtually, like you can't do a breast exam or a prostate exam virtually, like that would be interesting. But <laughs> but I'm actually so happy to see my patients in person. It's like, ah, oh, hallelujah. It's just like, and then it's hard not to talk, even though we're not supposed to be talking much because that's the point. Um, yeah. We're masked, but the connection is really, really part of what makes us human. It's part of what makes us heal. And it's part of how we, we kind of, it, it's, it's just grounding um, yeah. to our emotional health. So it's not a surprise that people are asking me all the time, can I go see my mother? take a plane, take a train, but you know, and the answer is it depends. But yeah, we are wired for survival. We are wired for connection. And, and I'm wondering how you how the kiddos are doing and are you connecting with them since you've not been able to be in schools, those 24 DC schools that you were in before the pandemic? So yes, um, it's been interesting. You know, we're, cause we're in elementary, middle and high school. So, you know, the little guys have, you know, that much time, you know, right. um, before the, all the filters come on and we're, you know, TikToking and all of the things. Um, <clears throat> we follow actually a curriculum. And so my school-based and home-based team, I think, um, really uh, try to stay true to the curriculum that we use. Most of what we do is groups 
in schools because we want to be able to see more kids, not to mention grief and trauma, it's such an, they are both such isolating experiences that groups are, tend to be helpful because it helps, especially kids understand, oh, I'm not the only kid yep. that this happened to. Yeah. Um, so we did continue groups. Um, there was a lot of shifting though. Um, some groups just, couldn't happen, some kids couldn't navigate it. So we did shift some of those groups to individual therapy. We also shifted to a fair bit of caregiver coaching um, and sort of conversate, helping conversation starting. Um, we are actually currently, not for our school base, but our office base, we had groups for kids already started. So we are still doing two groups for kids and you know the clinicians are sending home or mailing worksheets for kids to work oh on and then talk about and incredible and is this yeah. on 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 like through a smartphone or through a video conference it's through it's through zoom yeah um and you can do it yeah you can do it on a phone you can yeah i, I don't know how you've managed to i mean do all of this with only 40 five employees and 43 of them therapists. I mean, you were already doing, to me, what's the most important work um, out there, which is helping people who are struggling emotionally because it informs their physical health, it informs everything. It informs, for some people, it's life-threatening. Yeah. And then to layer the pandemic and to layer on, as you and I were talking about before the show, the emotional stress that your employees must be feeling when you're talking to someone for eight hours a day or different people for eight hours a day about the very intimate parts of their life and the traumas they're experiencing. I mean, that's exhausting. And then they have their own, they're humans as well. Yeah. So I, how, I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, I don't know how you do it all. So yeah, sometimes I wonder how we do it all too, <laughs> but I will say that in terms of um, of the clinical, of the WEN Center's staff, both our intake team as well as our clinical staff, well, our intake team, our, our clinicians, um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about, worrying about, are we taking good enough care? Are we, um, are we recognizing that they are humans too? Um, and that Zoom meetings are hard. Um, and, and so, you know, I, they, I have a clinical director who's phenomenal and she meets with the clinicians every single week um, or every other week, depending, um, really checking in with them about how they are as humans. I mean, that is um, so essential and, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it, it's the, it's the analogy I make to people all the time, you know, take the caregivers need care as well. Yeah. Whether you're caring for someone who has dementia or you're caring for someone who has COVID or who's depressed. I mean, we need care too. Like I ask for help when I need it. I have to practice what I preach to people and you yeah. are in a position as a social worker and as an empathetic person, like God love you to help your clinicians. And so I'd love to hear more about that. And then also talk about like other employers as we reopen, like how can other employers who aren't adept necessarily at managing their employees' mental health like you are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think in, in terms of, um, I think in terms, actually, I'm going to talk about the ones that are, but I think that it, this is, I, is broadly great. applicable. Um, much of, of what I try to do, I don't always succeed, but what much of what I try to do is create a culture and an environment where people feel okay to say, I need to tap out. Um, you know, I, I, I am not looking for a hero in any of my staff and, um, because it's not good for anyone. Um, and so I don't, I have no interest in having clinicians who 
who finish, you know, they arrive at a finish line, you know, road hard and put away wet and they're a mess and nobody's feeling good about anything. Um, so one of the things that we did was we just, uh, a few weeks ago, Memorial Day, the week before Memorial Day, my staff was struggling. And I know that because they have a great relationship with their clinical director. And she said, they're, they're struggling, they're going through it. So I said, you know what? Actually, one of my other managers was like, Michelle, unless you shut the whole thing down, people are gonna continue to work. And so we shut it down. Good for, for you. Good for, for you. Two extra days. I was like, you know what? I want everyone to have a four day weekend. Please do not work. We have to take care of ourselves. Good for you. I mean, that is leadership right there. And that is taking care of your employees. I mean, human capital just from, from the business sense, but more important from the, the, the moral and, and, you know, ethically responsible sense involves taking care of your staff like that. I think, you know, what I've heard from, people who who in whom they, they're trying to think about culture and you know making sure that people feel heard and that they don't you know accidentally burn out their staff is that well i worry that if they have this culture of you know raising your hand when you're not doing well that people aren't going to come to work or they're going to phone it in and you know i there's i've seen so many research studies out there that show that when people when there's a culture at work of let's care for each other like we care for ourselves that people are more loyal to their place and they they work better yeah that's right that's that's a hundred percent right and you said something really important which is you know the and this I, I i is has broad applicability which is you know regardless of what you do regardless of whether or not you run a construction company or a restaurant do your employees feel seen and heard. My staff does not always agree with decisions I make. Um, but what I hope they know is that I hear them. Um, and to the extent possible, I try and I try and say like, this is this, I'm looking for input because this is going to be a democratic decision, or I'm looking for input because it's going to help inform the decision that I'm going to make. Um, but, but I think it's important that folks do feel seen and heard, you know, people that I, you know, friends, family are afraid to go back to work. Um, and so rather than sort of that, well, you ha we're open, so you have to come in, you know, it might be more helpful to say, I, I know that you're scared. Is there anything that we can do as a company to help bring that fear down a little bit? You're not going to probably be able to take take all of the fear away, but to validate that it's something validating is exactly what I was going to say. Just to validate yeah. it and acknowledge that we're all in this together is huge. That's that's right. That's right. You know, when when this first started, I have a clinician. Um, who I absolutely, ad I, I adore all of my clinicians, truth be told. Um, this one sent me an email saying, I think the One Center is doing this all wrong. We should have been closed. And at first I was like, rude. But actually, <laughs> but actually I was like, you know what? Thank you for telling me that. Right. Um, and, and you know what? it actually made me pause and I went back to my management team and said, are we doing this wrong? And my management team went, we might be. Um, and so I think it is important to be able to kind of put that ego aside, which as leaders, say. as leaders, we lead, I lead with ego. You got to have a little bit of it to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to run whatever this is. That's right. It can get in the way. And, and so it's also helpful to have people around you where if it's getting in the way, they can tell you it's getting in the way. <laughs> well, and, and that's it. I think you said it so well. You, you have to be authoritative to be a leader, but you can also be a listener. Yeah. Let other people talk and listen and validate people's feelings. Even if you do nothing about it, which of course you hope that leaders will do, 
but at least you're hearing people and validating. But then, you know, the next step is to, you know, do something about it. If people feel very vulnerable, feel threatened at work, feel not heard. Yeah. I mean, there are simple things people can do. And it's not to say that now we need to live in boundaryless workplaces where, you know, everyone's talking about their feelings all the time and, you know, taking personal days just because they, you know, you know, got a bad haircut or something. I'm just saying like, there are ways to invest in your employees and to let them feel heard that does not sacrifice your work product and that actually enhances the loyalty of your, of your, of your employees. And actually people are better workers, as I was saying earlier. I mean, I think you know that, but I just think, I think it's really important. I'm talking to a lot of um, schools in DC. I'm doing some consulting for schools in DC on reopening. And, you know, kids are at less high risk. I mean, they're doing really well if they get coronavirus, but the educators and the administrators and the kitchen staff and all the people, the ancillary services, all the people who are interfacing with these kiddos in schools, I mean, are terrified. Yeah. And so one thing I'm recommending to these school leaders is, you know, it's acknowledging people's anxiety and, and talking about it and giving them resources, you know, to, to be able to talk about it because it's just, you can't run a school if there isn't enough, if there isn't empathy about the vulnerabilities people feel. That's right. And that, and I think that that is true for every business. Um, and again, like, you know, at the one center, do we have a big cry fest every morning? God, no. Um, and I'm, I imagine some of my staff manage their feelings with their colleagues. I don't know. I'm not part of that. Um, but I do know that um, it's really important that my staff say emo stay emotionally and physically well. Yeah. And I have a responsibility as their employer to help support that. So when I hear that somebody has a strong opinion, I listen. When I hear my director telling me my staff isn't doing well, I do something about it. Yeah. Um, what would you say to people who are listening right now and feeling anxious, feeling traumatized, perhaps not to the extent where they feel like they need counseling, although I would say if you're my patient, let's talk about that. Um, but, but sort of like the, 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 the sort of sustained anxiety, fear, vulnerability, that I think is sort of almost a universal condition right now. Um, I mean, I can tell you what I'm telling my patients, and it, of course, depends on the person. Of course, yeah. depends on the person. But what are what are you telling those patients who are, are people who are just feeling like the slow burn of anxiety? Um, so a couple of things, and and it's again, it's funny because all of all of what I'm telling people now um, are things that are good to do anyway. Yeah. One is manage what's coming into your space. How much news are you watching? How toxic totally. is a great the point. content? You know, are you constantly on social media feeds? Um, Mine is this that, one right now. But yes, be on this one. <laughs> um, but you know, because what we don't want to do is reinforce what's causing the anxiety and what's causing the trauma. I learned this after the Navy Yard shooting. We responded to the Navy Yard. And the next morning, there were all of these stories about the people who died. And I had done a bunch of the death notifications. And it just crushed me. And I was like, I have to limit what's coming in because I can't emotionally navigate that. Um, and that is something I just held to because I just. So smart. I want that space. I want I want there to be some peace in my space, and I don't find that um, right now in particular. Sorry to interrupt you, but but yeah, the news. I mean, there is important news, but you know, it's not like in March where we needed like a twice a day briefing on how to manage ourselves and what to do. And I mean, you cannot you can take a day off or two days off or three days off, and still feel with your have your finger on the pulse of what's happening yeah. um, and and you certainly don't need to be on social media all the time and having your phone ping you i mean it's so easy it's the path of least resistance is to be doing that all the time yeah so i think that's a great point michelle anyway sorry to interrupt you 
No, I no, that's what I think. I also think um, uh, this idea, and I, uh, I am not a woo woo therapist. Like you're very um, straightforward. I, I grew up in New Jersey. That's really what you yeah. need to know. Yeah, yeah. That's how I approach it. Call it like you see it. Yeah. Um, and I started to um, about two and a half years ago. I people started to use the word reactive with me. You're so reactive. Oh. Why are you reacting like that? And I was like, okay, that's starting to sound like a theme. Um, and so I decided Good for you to for listening. Thanks. <laughs> so I decided to try meditation, which I was like, I will never try meditation. I will not. Um, I have to tell you, it has been a game changer for me. Um, and you don't have to, it's not like you know, sitting like Indian style going or crisscross applesauce going kumbaya. Um, I use this app called 10% Happier. It's like seven minutes or 10 minutes you can choose. And it has helped kind of calm my brain down a little bit and interrupt. If I'm in a loop, it helps interrupt that loop. Um, the, the other piece of it is, it is about mindfulness. So it's about, wait a minute. I'm in charge of what I'm thinking. Um, I may not be in charge of what I'm feeling, but I am in charge of how I'm responding to that feeling. Can I hit the pause button? Um, and so for, for, for me and for a lot of people, meditation and mindfulness actually do help you hit that pause button and really reflect on, you know, let me have a conversation about this with myself. I think um, it's so important as a medical doctor, I recommend it to my patients all of the time. And I do get some responses like, oh, that's so woo woo, that's so trendy. It's a 3000 year old trend. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's not trendy. It's just that it's, I think the reason it seems trendy is because it's almost a necessity of modern life, in my opinion, to have tools at your disposal, like meditation that are you can do anywhere, anytime. And you're right, it helps calm that adrenaline and cortisol stress hormone axis. It helps you feel more in control of your thoughts and the reactions, as you said. And so it actually helps. I've, I've seen a number of patients of mine w through meditation lower their blood pressure, help with their emotional eating, help with their relationship to alcohol, and help with their relationship with their spouse or their coworker. It's just such a wonderful tool. So I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, it, it has really been, it's, it's, it's been super helpful for me, but I think more importantly, for all of the people in my world. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you're, like, can you please am, I, you're like, can you please meditate like right now? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like you need a minute, Michelle. <laughs> you need a minute, just right. take a minute. Take seven. <laughs> yeah, take seven minutes. I do think I'm probably 10% kinder as a result. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I like that app because I have Headspace mm -hmm. and I've used it, um, but I think I need a new voice. So 10% Happier is, was actually a book by Dan Harris, who's an ABC reporter. And the yeah. full title is like 10% Happier Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. And I was like, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fidgety Skeptics, oh my gosh. That, it sounds so yeah. familiar. Yes, so I do. I highly, highly recommend it. That's awesome. The other thing that I think is super important and can be challenging and takes a little bit of discipline is really this idea of gratitude. And again, I, I know it's trendy and I know it sounds woo woo. Um, and there is so much science behind how important a gratitude practice is. Um, and you know, you don't have to write in a journal, but it's, it's, it's kind of tied to that idea of mindfulness. It's taking the time to notice something good. Um, and so, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, I won the lottery good. It, it can be, you know, it can be whatever I, you know, part of, of, for me, um, it, that I'm incredibly grateful for is in my neighborhood, it is our practice 
and has been since I've lived here for 12 years. We all visit on our porches. It's oh a very gosh, decent that is thing. So lovely. And so every day, now it's not even after work because you know we're working from home, but um, we eat, we all, there's three houses and we just visit and then the neighbors come walking and they're, you know. Love it. And it's just, it, it is something that is so simple. And we, sometimes we're not even talking to each other. We're all just sitting on our porches, sharing time with one another. Um, and so that is stuff where it's so simple. It does, it's not a big deal, but it is something that I, I'm so grateful for, and I try and make sure to remind myself. I'm also like with mindfulness, the other thing I'm trying to do, and again, like it's so, it sounds so basic, but it's important is I realized that I was not enjoying the first sip of coffee in the morning and coffee is delicious. Um, and I so think I know um, where you're going with this. I'm interested. So I was like, you know what? Let me actually be really intentional and take a minute and taste my coffee. Um, and it, I mean, it, you can do it with washing dishes. Like people hate washing dishes. Think about how nice that warm water feels on your hands and how good that soap feels. Um, and the, the feeling of accomplishment when you've got all of your dishes done. These are things that is so simple. It's stuff we do every single day, but very rarely do we stop and say, you know what, that was really nice. That tasted really good. You know, really I think good. it's so, there's such good points. And I think particularly when we're in crisis, which I think you could call right now, we our brains tend to stick to the negative. Yeah. Like it sticks to the, oh my God, I spilled the coffee on my pants. Oh my God. Or I, oh my God, like I'm late or oh my, you know. And somehow our brains are able to attend to those negative thoughts, but right. if you crowd them out, if you will, with the with the gratitude, that's that's all around us. It's just you have to look for it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and you don't have to look far, right? It's the water on your hands. It's the sitting next to your neighbor on the porch who's not even talking to you, but just in the presence. But, but if you look, if you're looking for it or have your eye open to it, it's there. And then, there are so many studies to show that practicing gratitude lowers the stress hormones and improves health and improves your sense of well-being and calm. And there's, I think when you're in the midst of a crisis like we are, being able to be mindful actually gives, it gives me a sense of control back. Yeah, I was going to say and that's as, great. And as somebody who feels a need to have some agency over her, her well-being, that is empowering for me. And I, and I would venture a guess, it's not a guess, I know that this is true, um, that it is when we take agency over our choices in our life, it is empowering and it helps us feel stronger and get, gain a sense of control in an environment that feels completely out of our control. I agree. Those are great points. So just to summarize, it was, it's basically pruning your media, mm -hmm. practicing mindfulness through yeah. meditation or other ways. And if you want to get started, I think that 10% Happier app sounds awesome. There's also one of my favorite books by John Kabat-Zinn called Wherever You Go, There You Are. It's one yeah. of my favorite books. It's like a little thin book about mindfulness and being present. Even reading it is just a delight. And then practicing gratitude. And, and then I think we talked a little bit intermixed through there is connecting with other people, even if it means you're, you know, six feet apart, you know, trying to connect. I'm actually recommending, you know, even though it's controversial and to, to, to be with other people right now, I, I'm actually recommending for many of my patients for their mental health to travel to see their mother or their friend, you know, ideally by car. Um, and ideally like all in one swoop. So you don't just to stop too many, too many hotels or places, but because the connection is so important for our mental health, and this is a bit of a window right now, at least in the DC area, I'm encouraging people for their mental health, like take a risk and do a hug. There's a way to hug that's less risky, which is you're facing the opposite direction and you'll kind of do a big hold your breath hug and then move away. I mean, it sounds so 
like a science project, but hugs are really, really important. Super important. I mean, they're really important, the touching and the holding. I mean, it's really, really important. So, you know, for some of my older patients who are very worried about their vulnerability, they just, they need that for their mental health, to hug and to be with their grandkids and their ways to mitigate the risk. It's just, I think the connection, I think we underestimate sometimes how important that is for our health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I actually did go and visit my mom in North Carolina because I just, I was really missing her and I just, I needed a change of scenery and I, she needed me and I needed her and it was great. Was it great? <laughs> It was great. It was so good. So nice. And you drove and you, I, I mean, good I for you. Once I was really intentional about the route, um, primarily because my mom has COPD, so she's high risk. And so I yes. wanted to be able to be as safe as I possibly could for her. Yeah. My son and my husband are on the road right now driving um, up to Maine, but they're going to stop in Boston to see my husband's mother, my mother-in-law. And they're so excited. She is so excited. I think even having that, you know, on the calendar for yeah. everybody, knowing that there's this connection is just so meaningful. And I think it's given her and my husband and my son a sense of like, ha, ah, we get to see grandma. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, um, Michelle, I am so grateful that you came and talked to this group and to me today. You are like a gift <laughs> from the heavens. So um, nice. And I think the problem with that is that you, ha you're, you have so much, the problem with you being such a good therapist and person is that you have so much work to do all the time. Your work is never done. It is never done. <laughs> it's never done. Your work is never done. That's but right. what I love hearing from you is that you're setting an example, you're modeling you know, to our audience right now and to your staff and for yourself, taking care of yourself the way you need to, to be the best therapist and executive director that you can. I try to do the same thing. I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm a work in progress, but you know, I try to practice what I preach, sleeping, prioritizing meals, connecting with other people, trying to be mindful. It's, it's you know, one day at a time, of course, right? Right. But I think it's important that we recognize that we're humans, we're all vulnerable in this particular moment, and we have vulnerabilities throughout our lives, and that help is there if we need it, professional help, and it affects your mental health and your physical health, the, the, the traumas and losses that we experience throughout life. So thank you so much, and keep up the amazing work at the WEN Center, and I'll see you next time. Yes, thanks for having me. Bye, Michelle. Take Bye. care.